All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be talking about how modern Muslims are attempting to quote unquote reform Islam, but what they're actually doing in the process is deforming it. I have a special guest today, Islamic Clarity. He has his own YouTube channel. A link to that is in the description. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but first let me open us with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to connect with believers and non-believers around the world. We ask that anyone watching today who is not a Christian, um, especially if they're a Muslim, approach the material with an open mind. That they not simply dismiss what we have to say, but instead uh, think about it and look into the matters for themselves. So we don't ask that people just take our word for it. We want people to look at the sources and think for themselves. We ask that you be with us today, that you guide our discussion and give us the words to say. We ask that anything that we say that is useful is applied to people's lives and anything that is false or not useful is simply forgotten. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, um, I have a guest here today. He just goes by Islamic Clarity, which is the name of his channel. His channel is kind of dedicated to providing uh, some, some focus to what Islam actually teaches. You know, you, you might talk to 10 different Muslims and you might get 10 different answers about what Islam teaches on a particular subject. So what his goal is, is one to, to, you know, kind of document what all these different people are saying, put them in different categories, different uh, breeds of Islam, so to speak, different uh, sex isn't the right word because, you know, they generally all claim to be part of the same sect, but they have different philosophies of how to look at the Islamic texts and evaluate those. So his goal is kind of to, um, one is to clarify where people stand so that people who are not Muslims can better understand what Islam teaches. He puts out uh, quite a good number of clips each day, um, uh, kind of taking arguments that Muslims are making, putting them out there, uh, you know, so you don't have to watch the hour long video of the Muslim, you can just get that little snippet. You may have seen on a, um, either Jay Smith's channel or David Wood's channel that Yazir Qadi is leaving social media. Well, Islamic Clarity had that on his channel before either of them did. Uh, I'm not saying they got it from him. They, they probably got it from Qadi, but uh, you know, he's really on top of current events, really uh, keeping tabs on what the Muslim apologists are doing. Uh, any words of introduction you'd like to say? Um, yeah, so like um, Thaddeus said, uh, I'm Islamic Clarity. You can call me IC, whatever. Um, but uh, like you said, our focus is to make Islam's teachings clear to the world in English. Um, one thing I found um, as I've talked to Muslims and um, you know, with my Muslim friends is I was just uh, very surprised by some of the things they told me. You know, they, they would tell me things, they would show me Zachary Nike videos, and I would say, uh, that's interesting. So I would go online and look it up, and I would find that there's a lot of um, what I like to call hashtag Islamic confusion on the internet. And um, especially as a Westerner too, um, I think, yeah, there's just a lot of Islamic confusion. I think Islamic clarity would be helpful for us all. Uh, excellent. And I did also want to read a comment that was left before we started the broadcast from uh, Nanya Dibnis. She said, with Lloyd's encouragement, I have been using Reliance of the Traveler when I discuss with Muslims. Since it has eliminated abrogated verses, it helps th cut through the fog and provides clarity. And that's what we're talking about today. You know, just getting a clear picture of where Islam stands on the issues so that we can properly um, decide whether those yes. issues are true or not. You know, right. when we don't know what someone believes, it's really hard to argue for or against it. Uh, we Absolutely. just don't really know. Yep. Uh, so I have a couple <coughs> introductory questions for you before we sure. dive into the presentation. And the first is just, you know, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I don't think I said this yet, but thank you so much, Thaddeus, for having me on. I really appreciate it. And um, I appreciate you, you know, just um, connecting um, and to give me this platform to talk. 
Um, but yeah, so for my background, actually, I didn't really have many Muslim friends until a few years back. And like I just said earlier, um, you know, uh, I, I was, you know, as I got to know um, some people um, who are Muslims and I, I was talking to them, especially my one friend, um, and, you know, he, he was talking to me this one day and I was asking him, like, so what is it that you believe? You know, tell me about that. And he, he, he started to tell me these things. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And he's like, here, just watch this guy. He'll explain it to you. And he pushes his phone into my face. And um, not in a rude way, but it's, it's Zachary Knight, you know, Dr. Zachary Knight. And I, I get my introduction to Dr. Zachary Knight. Like, oh, yes, yes. You know, the brother asked a good question. And um, I was just like, wow, like, this is so fascinating because there's this whole world. You know, I started to look at these videos and there are millions and millions of views on these videos and hundreds of thousands of subscribers, not just on his channel, but on so many of these channels on social media. And so then, you know, as a Westerner growing up in um, the West, I, I think that we have these kind of two camps of, um, of people's views on Islam, especially in America. You have like the CNN, Islam is a religion of peace kind of narrative. And then you have Fox News, like creeping Sharia, like be scared, Islam is terrorism. And I genuinely didn't know what was true. Like I really felt like I know so many, I know Muslims who are some of the nicest people. They're so hospitable, they're so kind. And yet I see these things on the news. I don't wanna be naive. So when I dug into Islam more online, what I found was that there's a lot of confusion um, even online. So as I was digging, as I was reading, it was so hard to see like, what do I trust? What do I not trust? And um, it took me quite a bit of time and work to figure out like what was really going on. And um, that's part of why I felt like this was important, um, Islamic clarity, because um, if someone, um, you know, who does have English as their first language and, um, you know, can read a lot of these resources in English is still having such a hard time, you know, sifting through all the, all the kind of material out there, how much more for people that aren't speaking English or speaking Arabic or speaking, you know, Urdu or whatever language, like how much harder is it for them to find um, accurate information about Islam and what it teaches. So that's kind of from there, um, you know, that was a few years ago. And from there, I've kind of had this in mind as a, as a project. And, um, you know, recently I've been moving forward with it. Uh, excellent. So you, you kind of covered how you got interested in Islam. I, I think that's the way that, you know, many people get interested in another religion, yeah. they talking with their friends and discovering what they believe. I know that before I was introduced to Islam, I didn't have uh, you know, even though I was doing Christian apologetics, I didn't have a huge amount of understanding about what Muslims believe. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of thought that it was similar to, to Christianity. You know, we have the Bible, they have the Quran. That's what their religion's based on. It was quite a shock to learn yeah. that the Quran is only like 10% of the Islamic right. scriptures right. When, I, when I really dived into it. And the other thing that was really shocking was to learn how much of Islam is based on authority. You know, mm. what, what, the, what the leaders are saying, like your friend there, he, yeah. he can't explain the argument to you. He just says, right. watch Zucker Nike. Right, right. <laughs> His confidence is based not on understanding what he believes, but because Zucker Nike speaks with a lot out of confidence. Of confidence, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, you alluded to your goals for the, the channel, but uh, what made you you know, uh, take that important step and, and actually start the channel. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess just really seeing how much Islamic confusion there was. You know, I like to use these hashtags, so if you don't mind, hashtag Islamic confusion, because um, really just going on social media, going on comment sections in YouTube and seeing how people could say things that were just so ill-informed. I mean, again, in America, we have a lot of the progressives, um, political um, left, who are very, um, I would say, uh, sympathetic to Islam because there's this kind of political allyship. But then there's this, I think, a real naivety and a real, um, uh, I want to use the right word here, like um, a mis like not a good, not a strong grasp on what um, the, the texts of Islam teach. You know, not, I mean, obviously individual Muslims will believe any number of things, but what the actual text and what the tradition says. And then on the political right, I saw a lot of demonization of Muslims and like fear of Muslims. And I was like, well, that neither of these really seems fair or accurate. And I, I really want to be, um, you know, compelled by love, but also compelled by, um, like compelled by love for Muslims and for non-Muslims, both to, for people to understand and also a love for the truth, right? Like, I don't want things to be misrepresented. And that's something I'm very open about on my channel is like, if we've misrepresented something or if we got something wrong, please let me know. I want to correct that. I don't want to put out false information and I don't want to, you know, clip things that, 
are, are smearing, you know, like, like misrepresenting someone's position. I want to accurately represent what people believe. And so again, when you ask that question of what made me make that step, it was just seeing how, like, how much of a lack there was here and how much of a, um, how important this really is for the sake of both the Muslims to not be misrepresented, but also for the sake of the non-Muslims to not think that Islam is something that it isn't, um, if that makes sense. Uh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, there was a uh, super chat from Chloe Wicked. Uh, God bless you both. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, I have one other question for you. And then we have uh, a question from the chat that I'd like to take before we dive in. Uh, my question is, I, I went, the, when I first checked out your channel, I went to your first video, which is just like, you know, what is Islamic clarity? Yeah. And uh, you know, the, the video is pretty straightforward, just explains what you, what you want to do. You want to, you know, get to what Islam actually teaches, clarify where different Muslim leaders stand on issues. Right. What I found very interesting, though, was that in the comments, there was a number of Muslims who are like, well, what are your ulterior motives here? Uh, right. you, you couldn't possibly uh, be a Muslim uh, and wanted to know what Islam teaches. I know you're not a Muslim. Yeah. Right. So I, I just thought that was really weird. What was your reaction to quit comments like that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think obviously there's an interest in, um, you know, like um, in people's beliefs. But I really think that my personal beliefs aren't super relevant to this question of Islamic clarity. Right. Because the, the focus of this channel is not to make the argument whether Islam is true or false. The focus of this channel is to make the teachings and the positions of individual Muslim leaders, organizations and countries clear to people. Right. So then, like you said, I think earlier, if it's clear, then people can decide use, using whatever framework or worldview they want, if it's true or not, you know, whether that's a humanist worldview or a Christian worldview or a Hindu worldview. But if it's not even clear, you can't even begin to have that conversation. And I think um, that's why I think even Muslims should be in favor of Islamic clarity. You know, it's it's. Um, um, I think Daniel Hakekachu, who we'll talk about later, he's been one of the biggest proponents of Islamic clarity from a conservative perspective, because he's like, whoa, 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 all these imams are you know, preaching this woke um, Islam that's not really true. And so he's kind of pushing back and saying, I need Islamic clarity from you guys on where you stand. And so again, I don't see my job um, in, in this on this channel and uh, for Islamic clarity to be making that argument of whether Islam is true or false, but rather, is it clear or is it unclear? Excellent. So the, the question from God's servant is, uh, what do you think is the strongest argument against Islam? Or if you prefer to answer a question yeah. more relevant, uh, what do you think is an issue that there is an exceptionally large amount of lack of clarity on? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the biggest issues that where there's a lack of clarity is hadith um, and about where these actual beliefs come from and um, how reliable they are um, and how we got them and how um, hadiths translate into the practice and belief of Muslims. And I think that's when, you know, later when we talk about Bukhari Gate, which is why it's such a, uh, a fraught issue is because that whole question of interpreting hadith and, um, and how that translates into, you know, shaping the religion Islam is so, so, um, uh, unknown to the average Muslim. It's really in darkness and, and even to the average non-Muslim, right? It's, um, um, or even the Islam's critics, people who actively are working to criticize Islam, they're largely ignorant of, of Hadith science and, and just what a huge um, field that is um, and how, how complicated and, and layered it is, right? So I think that's a place where um, a lot of clarity can be shed. And once clarity is shed there, um, a lot of these questions that people bring up, like Aisha's age or, um, you know, drinking camel urine or what have you, um, they're all going to come to light and um, it's going to become easier to ask Muslim leaders, what do you think about this, um, when their paradigm behind their approach to Hadith is also understood. Because right now, I think a lot of Muslim apologists can hide behind some hand waving about Hadith science when, because people don't really understand Hadith science. But once that's made simple and clear, then um, it'll become a lot easier for people to get that Islamic clarity. Excellent. Uh, I, I lied though, we do have one more question. Okay, no problem. Uh, uh, so Villainous would like to know, is it a strategy to mix confusion to get a point across in Islam or is it for Dawah? Um, I mean, 
I, I, I'll leave that to people to judge. I think there's, um, if you watch videos, um, I mean, we'll talk more about this later, but there's this one video where um, there's an IARA panel, which is a, a big Muslim Islamic organization in the UK. And um, a question is asked about apostasy laws in Islam. Um, and uh, excuse me, a question is asked about the treatment of, of um, non-Muslims in Islamic state, specifically ISIS. And so Tom Holland, are you familiar with Tom Holland? Yes. Yeah, he, so he's on the panel and he's, he challenges um, Abdullah Al Andalusi, who's a UK Dai. And he challenges him saying like, you know, like, yeah, please answer this question, you know, with ISIS and um, the Yazidis and the treatment of non-Muslims. And so um, Abdullah says like, no, no, like, you know, there's hadith that say that um, even Yazidis and even Hindus can be treated as people of the book. And he says this to applause from the IR audience. And he's kind of shutting this down. Like, like, you don't know anything. ISIS is obviously not Islamic. And then later on, I tweeted at him, you know, I tweeted at him that clip from the video. And I said, is this true? Do you believe this, that, that Hindus can be considered people of the book? And then he responded by saying, that's, I didn't, I never said, I personally believe that. I just said that the Hadith tradition says that's permissible, right? So, so when he's at, on this panel in front of all these people, he can, you know, very confidently and even, um, you know, uh, what's the word, mockingly dismissive, um, this, with this very dismissive tone, say that to Tom Holland in front of this crowd full of Muslims. But then when it comes to on the record, you know, what do you actually think about this? Um, it's all of a sudden, oh, no, no. Uh, it, my personal opinion is not, um, is not important. And so that, I think, I mean, people can interpret that as they want, but I think the fact that that's happening and it can be documented is important and it should be put out there so people can make their own judgment for that. Yeah, excellent. Um, you know, it might not be unique to Islam, but I definitely find that there is a lot of word games going on that, you know, people will purposely say something that the Western mind will interpret in one way, right. but they know that the, the Muslim mind will interpret in a different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, they're kind of, you know, talking out of both sides of their, their mouth where they, right. they're giving one message to the, the Western audience and a different yeah. one to the Muslim audience, sometimes by saying the exact same words. Right, and there's definitely dog whistles. I mean, people who know what to listen for understand what's, what's being said. Um, yeah, I think a big one is when you say things like, in a Sharia state, or if all the Sharia conditions are met, you know, and then you continue to follow up with something, it's like, okay, well, people who are aware know, you know, what you mean by that versus people who don't, so. Uh, excellent. So uh, you can go ahead and load up your presentation. Uh, Chloe said that she has subscribed to your channel and I wanna oh, encourage everyone hello. else to do that as well. There's a link in the video description and when we uh, complete, I'll put one in a pinned comment as well. I can't put a comment before the video is out. So I have to wait till after that. We're done to put that, but uh, definitely head over there, check out his material and subscribe if you like what you see. Uh, he's little over 800 subscribers right now and 1000 is a really important milestone because it gives you access to the community page. Uh, I know I was very excited when I hit 1000. Um, so yeah, I can just get started. So Islamic clarity. Um, so when you look at Islam in the West, this was a poll done in the UK in 2017, 35% of people think Islam is a threat to the British way of life. So my point here is, if you look at the more liberal voters in the Labour Party, that number is down at 20%, and then the more conservative voters. But overall, 35% of, of Brits, you know, believe that Islam is a threat. That just goes to show how much confusion there is, right? Like these people are probably think one thing about Islam, these people think another, what is actually true? What do individual UK Muslims think? What do their leaders believe? That is a huge question mark. And I think that um, would really benefit from clarity. So here's an example of um, what's happening with Islam in the West. So you have a statement like Muhammad slept with a nine-year-old girl, which is um, you know, true according to the Islamic sources. And then you have two categories of people. You have your non-Muslims and you have your Muslims, right? So among your Muslims, you have people who do know that this is you know, true, like Daniel Hakekachu and Muhammad Hijab, and they accept it. They accept that it's true and they don't try to reinterpret it or they don't try to um, reject it. But then you have people who know it's true according to the sources, but they reject it. And so they find ways to say, no, actually she was older or this is unreliable. But then the more interesting thing is that you have Muslims who don't know. 
So there's a lot of Muslims in the Middle East, North Africa, and also in Southeast Asia, who just don't know that this is in the tradition, but they would accept it if they knew. They would say, yes, of course, it's, you know, Muhammad, the, the prophet of Allah, of course, it's okay. Um, and then you also have Western Muslims. And I'm not talking about white converts to Islam. I'm talking more about the children of immigrants, like um, Pakistani or, um, uh, you know, immigrants who have grown up in the West, so who have a more humanistic mindset oftentimes. These people often don't know about these things, but because of the internet and because of critics of Islam and because of English, a lot of them are learning about this. And then in the non-Muslim category, you have, um, you know, apologists for Islam that are non-Muslims like Karen Armstrong, who um, you know, know about these things, but find ways to, again, accept it uh, or to defend it um, or sugarcoat it. Then you have Western liberals who are largely unaware, but if they did find out, they would also find ways to say, you know, this is cultural or this is, you know, you can't judge other people's cultures or lines like that. Then you have most Westerners here who don't know. And so most of these Westerners, if they found out Muhammad slept with a nine-year-old girl, they would reject that. They would feel like, uh, that's kind of awkward and <laughs> I don't like that. Um, and then of course you have people, non-Muslims who know and reject and who are actively being polemical about it like David Wood and Apostate Prophet. So on this next slide, I show kind of what is happening here. So when you bring Islamic clarity, when you help these Western Muslims know, a lot of them are gonna move to this kind of um, Hakikachu hijab quadrant where they're um, um, defending it and accepting it. Um, some of them will move to an Islam where they are uh, rejecting it and reinterpreting, but many of them will also leave Islam and they'll leave Islam because of this. So this is kind of just, um, you know, it's a summary of what I see happening as Islamic clarity is coming in, especially for Western Muslims. Um, I don't know if you want yeah. to add anything to that. Yeah, yeah excellent. You know, I, I always tell people uh, that I'm not afraid of people giving an honest examination to the, the Christian sources. Mm -hmm. If Christianity is true, you know, it should stand up to scrutiny. If Islam's true, it should stand up to scrutiny. Right. If you go into your sources and you find things you don't like, uh, well, you know, you it, it might be uncomfortable to learn those things. You might not like that you're you're questioning your beliefs, but ultimately you should want to know what's true and what's not. Right. And if there's things in the Muslim sources that that make people realize that Islam is, is false, they, they should want to know that. They shouldn't right. want to stay in a state of ignorance. Right. And I want to add to this quadrant is very interesting because you get a lot of Islamic clarity right here because you have people like Daniel Hakikachu who know and accept and are proud, right? Their tone is, of course we believe this. This is good. This is true. You know, we love it. And then you have people like Muhammad Hijab and Yasser Qadi who are like, well, mm, like, mm, well, okay. Uh, mm, mm. And so the tone that they even bring is a very interesting. And you'll see conflict between people like Hakikachu and Yasser Qadi about their approaches and their tone. And this, if you zoom in here, this will give you a lot of Islamic clarity about how Muslim leaders are reacting to Islamic clarity coming to the world. So. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, we, we, we definitely see two kind of competing trends in, in the Islamic apologist world. Some who say, you know, this is true. We, we shouldn't lie about it. If, right. if we're, we're giving people false information and then they discover the truth, they're going to leave Islam. Yes. And then you got others who are like, no, th this is too embarrassing. It couldn't possibly be true. We need to deny its truth. Right. Right. And, and yeah, exactly. And there's different approaches even within those two schools. Um, so on this one, I just give a little bit of a summary of Islamic confusion. So a lot of people, like I said earlier, think Islamic clarity is about proving Islam is false. And that's not true. Islamic clarity is about making the beliefs clear and the teachings clear to people. So for example, if you have a statement like, in an Islamic state today, public apostate should be killed. And do you agree with this? So if you ask your Muslim friend, you know, do you agree with that statement? They can either be clear about their answer or unclear. They can either say something like, yes, I believe it, that I agree. Or they can say, well, you know, it, uh, it depends on the, you know, the, the, the country and today, you know, I'm not, you know, it's scholars say different things. There's a lot of ways to be unclear. And so um, we at Islamic Clarity are hoping that Muslims can be clear about what they believe. And that's why I put Daniel Hakekachu here, even though he's a very conservative Muslim, he is a big proponent of Islamic Clarity because he's trying to demand Islamic Clarity from even other Muslims that he thinks are watering down their religion. So again, is your belief on this issue clear? So there's Islamic clarity and there's Islamic confusion. Now, this is not the same question as is your belief on this issue true? 
right? So you can believe that um, it's right to kill public apostates from Islam, but that doesn't mean that it is morally right to kill public apostates. So then you have people like David Wood, apostate prophet, and Colin from Islam Critique, who are making the argument that, no, this is morally wrong. And then you have, of course, the Muslims making the argument that, no, this is morally right. But again, I want to distinguish these two questions because they're very different questions. Like you said earlier, you can't have a conversation on whether or not something is true if you don't even know what the person believes, if you can't even be clear about where they stand. And so um, I think that's why Islamic Clarity is really trying to help make um, you know, the different stances of Muslim leaders, organizations, and countries clear to the world. And then people can decide for themselves, you know, is this true according to your worldview, whether that's a humanist worldview or a Christian worldview or what have you. Yeah, excellent. You know, I, I think that this, in theory, is something that everyone should want, whether they're, they're Muslims or not. They, they should want right. to know what Islam actually teaches yeah. when someone just, you know, tries to obfuscate and not really say anything. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't appreciate a Christian and preacher who did that, who, who right. you know, say that brought up some, uh, I say I asked a question about some difficult issue in Christianity and he just kind of waffled for talked for 10 minutes and didn't really say anything at all. I, right. I wouldn't appreciate that. So I, I, I think that Muslims should have the same opinion, whether or not they actually do. I think that yeah. this is something everyone should want. Right. Yep. I mean, it's, it's about being clear and, and um, yeah, having that Islamic clarity. Um, so I just, I know I talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, here's just an example of, um, you know, this is Abdullah Al Andalusi, 18,000 followers, um, you know, founder of the Muslim Debate Institute. Um, you can see him sitting here teaching a mosque full of young men. Um, and here's what he says, right? So I asked him about um, the age of Aisha. And he says, um, it is a fact that the main, if only historical reports have across different schools of thought, um, tradition collections to all seem to agree on a age is a fact. That's where Dawah stops. Whether it's historically true or not is a different question for scholars. So again, he says here, um, you know, the it, it's historically agreed upon, but whether or not it's true is different. So I'm like, okay, well, do you believe that it's true or not? Um, and then he says, you already know the mainstream scholarly understanding is likely to be accurate. So you see, even in this, you know, these three tweets, how reluctant he is to just come out and say, I believe Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad slept with her. You know, like it just this this kind of pushing a barrier out, pushing a barrier out. And if people don't know the mainstream view, then they wouldn't get that. And if they can't read through the lines between the lines of what he's saying, um, then you wouldn't be able to get clarity on what he actually believes. Um, and here again with his, uh, you know, on the point of um, Hindus being people of the book, he says, my personal adaptations within Islamic thought are irrelevant to Dawah. Dawah is a call to Islam, not the specific fake of Abdullah El Andalusi. So he's basically saying, you know, my personal opinion on this question of Hindus being treated as people of the book is irrelevant because I'm calling you to Islam. But then I challenged him. I said, well, within Islam, there's so much diversity on this question, right? So if you're calling people to Islam, you can't just say you're calling people to Islam. You have to let people know, like, where do you, like, what kind of Islam are you calling them to? And then he says, you know, if you want to increase your understanding, go to Hanafi um, and all these other scholars. And of course, these are the four major schools of Sunni Islam. So again, it's this constant, um, excuse me, I shouldn't say constant, but there's this, in, in these conversations, you see this sort of stonewalling, right? These uh, putting up these uh, comments that seem like they're answering the question, but really they're just giving you a non-answer in a way. And I think that is one of the strategies of it, that perpetuates Islamic confusion. And it really prevents people from knowing what people believe. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, these uh, tweets here are, are very illustrative because he could just give you the answer, but instead he says, <laughs> He, he says, well, my opinion doesn't matter. Yeah. And then you, you say, well, well, which school do you follow? He's like, well, here, here's all the schools. Exactly. Go, go read them all. Exactly. Uh, right. And of course, the idea, uh, I, I think that two things are happening. One, he doesn't want to be nailed down because, you know, then yes. some of his, his followers will be like, well, I disagree on that point. Right. Uh and he'll upset them, but more so, he, he knows that the, the person asking the question almost certainly isn't going to go read up on all these scholars, so they'll remain mm -hmm. ignorant, and that's what exactly. he wants to happen. 
there's so much of that. I t completely agree. So much of these, um, you know, Salafi refuters that you see, they just say something and then the, the followers are like, yes, it's been refuted. You know, even if you don't even watch the video, if you just see, oh, apostate prophet has been refuted or this video has been refuted, you just feel this peace like, okay, it's been dealt with. I don't have to worry about that anymore. So yeah, there's definitely. And then of course, you know, you see um, uh, the more conservative Muslims are not going to be happy if he comes out and says, I think Hindus should be treated as, as people of the book. You know, his whole initiative is trying to create a big tent Islam, right? And so when I even asked him if Shias or Ahmadiyyas should be considered as Muslims or not, he was very, uh, he just said, obviously anyone who believes the basic tenets of Islam should be considered as Muslims. It's like, well, do they or do they not? And again, you know, he, he didn't really give me more details there. So again, this is just an example of this type of conversation happens all the time in QA forums and um, on social media um, where, you know, you're not getting that kind of clarity. And very few people are really drilling down and pursuing that kind of clarity specifically. And so our hope is to create um, on, you know, on our website that we're working on to create a database where you can just search every single person and their stance on every single issue um, that could be relevant. Um, and here's another one, uh, Muhammad Hijab and wife beating. And this was in a video from 2018. He said, um, this is obviously about Quran um, uh, 434. Um, he says, this is telling a man or a husband how to defend himself against his wife. So um, here, you know, he's explaining, giving some great Islamic clarity. I really appreciate it about his stance. Um, you know, whether this is a reasonable interpretation of that verse or not, I'll leave it to others to, to decide. But at least he's making it very clear where he stands. And um, I think this is, Great, thank you, Muhammad Ijab, for this Islamic clarity. Um, Excellent. So um, again, here's another example, Daniel Hakikachu on Flat Earth. Um, he, um, this was on a Facebook post from 2016. He said, on a spiritual level, I really cherish the passages in the Quran and the Hadith that conflict with modern scientific understandings. Um, the ayat um, about Dol um, Karnayn and Surat al kaf um, about the setting place of the sun, as well as the Hadith cited above, are really beautiful and powerful to me. And there's no reason to rush to interpret them metaphorically or somehow anything less than the pure, pristine, direct description of reality given to us by Allah, the creator and master of all reality. So, I mean, you can see he's very clearly not telling us whether or not he believes in a flat earth. And he's very clearly, you know, kind of, making this criticism of scientism, which, you know, sure, you can make that criticism, but then he's going from there to say, well, that's why I'm not going to answer whether I think directly I believe in a flat earth or not. And I would love some more Islamic clarity on Daniel Kekachu on what he believes is the shape of the earth. You know, um, does he believe it's flat or does he believe it's spherical? And um, I think that kind of clarity would be very helpful to the people who are interested in his brand of Islam. I mean, if people are okay with that and they're like, yeah, I love that he denies, you know, the spherical earth or not denies, excuse me, he's open to, to not, you know, have, um, believing in a spherical earth. Um, uh, that, that, that just shows how, how committed he is to the unadulterated religion. Then sure, more power to them. But also there might be some people who say, oh, I like what he's saying on these other issues, but he doesn't even, he can't even say that the earth is spherical. Oh my goodness. What, 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 kind of, uh, what kind of hermeneutic does he have? What do I have to sign up for here? And I think people deserve to know that before they, um, sign up with Daniel Kekachu. Uh, excellent. There's uh, two comments that I wanted to address. Um, Fleeting Blue said, and every academic would agree with that reply going back to the, the, the tweets. And I, I think that's, you know, exactly what we're saying that it's kind of a, a secret language, so to speak, that people in the know know exactly what he means, but people right. who are not already in the know have no way of getting there because he, he's not giving any real information. Right. And, and that's what we hope to do is to make that clear. Yeah. And then uh, Virginia commented on, the, you know, this reputation uh, culture. She says, you've been refuted. <laughs> yeah. Even when there's nothing really to refute. Uh, right. For example, how can you refute Islamic clarity when all he does is compile clips? Exactly. And, right. You know, I, I get that too time, from time to time. I'll have a video that... Uh, you know, all it is is say a news report about something that will happen. And they'll be like, this video is all lies. I will refute you. And I'm like, what are you refuting exactly? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I agree with that. Um, okay. So Islamic confusion, again, these are some of the standard narratives that um, Muslims have used in the past. And a lot, a lot of these were popularized by Ahmadiyya and um, that kind of um, Salafism that spread around the world through Saudi money um, in the this past century, um, and you know the scientific miracles in the Quran. So now um, Hamza Torres and other 
major uh, Muslim apologists, you know, purposely don't use this anymore. They say like, we should not be using this. This is not a good argument. Um, but the Quran is perfectly preserved dot by dot. This is what we're seeing being deconstructed right now. Um, even in the last few months, so much has happened in this field. Um, there's a miracle of the number 19 in the Quran. Again, something that um, people used to say and now is becoming less and less popular. And then I think some of the next narratives that are going to um, be challenged are that um, Saheb Bukhari um, is a collection of hadith that's trustworthy. And um, also Muhammad is a perfect moral example for all times. So these of course are going to be, um, you know, it's gonna take time for these to be deconstructed, but, uh, I mean, you can see even on Twitter, people still use scientific miracles in the Quran. You still hear about embryology. So it's about getting that information and filtering it down to the masses. And that's going to take time. And I think that's really one of the focuses of Islamic clarity is to make everyone's positions on it clear, put it out on the record so that people can see it. And I think the internet um, and English are doing so much to speed up this process. Yeah, you know, the, the scientific miracles is a, a great example of this because, you know, the. It, common Muslims will often raise it in the, in the comments. And, you know, I can try to show how the, the passage in question doesn't really say what they claim it says and whatnot. Or what I found is really effective is just direct them to a video by a Muslim leader saying there's yeah. no science in the Quran. <laughs> right, and, right. And, and then, I mean, what are they, they can't argue with that. Exactly. Yeah, I think there's a clip of Yasser Qadi saying like, you know, really, he's just trying to be like letting them down easy. Like, guys, like, guys, can we just like, stop using the scientific arguments. <laughs> like, um, and yeah, you see that happening even now with the preservation of the Quran dot by dot, which we'll talk about more, hashtag Quran gate, you know, Yasser Qadi was, I think, trying to do that too, ripping off the bandaid, you know, um, taking, taking the hit for the team to move the narrative forward because it's just unsustainable. It's just factually and patently untrue. Okay, so um, this one is, I think, really uh, important. So it's about deforming Islam. So I've, I've touched on some of these ideas, but I just want to summarize it in one chart. So I think the biggest threat that we see to Islam today is actually human Islam. It's this um, humanism on the inside and Islam on the outside. And I think that's what we see a lot of Muslims, especially in the West, and even in um, you know, Middle East, North Africa, they ascribe to this. And why? Because humanist culture through pop culture, movies, uh, music, TV shows has infiltrated so many of the young Muslims thinking. So you have Muslims like Adam Saleh, who have 4 million plus YouTube subscribers taking pictures with James Charles, an openly gay man. Um, and you have these really prominent uh, hijabi influencers with hundreds of thousands of subscribers taking off hijab very publicly, right? So there's this sort of movement towards a cultural Islam that um, is, is not attached to, you know, it still says, oh, Islam is good. It's a beautiful thing, but it's about like you no know, compulsion or religion, right? <laughs> and it's about all these other things that aren't particularly faithful to the tradition. Um, and then you have compassionate imams like Omar Suleiman and Yasser Qadi, who are kind of unwittingly providing a theological cover for these people. So these are the guys who are saying, you know what, it's okay to vote in elections. You know, that's kind of a controversial issue. It's okay to agree to disagree on that. It's okay for women to come to the mosque. So they're trying to bring an Islam for the 21st century. Um, but they're also trying to hold on to the conservative devotion. And they're trying to hold on to the heart of Islam while um, bringing it up to speed for the 21st century. And um, you see Ilhan Omar, right, probably the most famous American Muslim who actively supports LGBTQ plus rights, um, you know, dances at pride parades, um, you know, supports abortion rights. Um, you know, we don't know what her personal beliefs are on it, but at least publicly, that's what she presents. And then you have people like Jonathan Brown, again, who's similar to Yasser Qadi. So um, these compassionate imams just had a recent a huge controversy. Did you hear about what happened with Omar Suleiman and the, um, the migrant march? Uh, I did not. Okay, so he was at a march, um, kind of interfaith political activist march for migrants, and he um, poured out libations on the beach, and he like shouted out declarations, and there was like people being anointed by LGBT priestesses, and this went crazy because um, Daniel Hakekachu found a video of it, and he posted it, and it blew up in the Muslim world. Like everyone was talking about it. And um, basically Omar uh, uh, kind of put out this apology that wasn't really an apology. He was like, you know, it was a lapse. And then Daniel Kikich was like, how is this a lapse? This is shirk. Like you compassionate imams are destroying the religion. You're destroying the deen. And then you have all these young Muslims who are joining Daniel Kikich. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, the, you know, this big dawah machine, like down with the yakin machine, down with Omar Salimah. But then you have all these other Muslims are like, no, these people are just full of it. They're all these refuters. 
And that's why Yasser Qadi has been coming out with all these videos recently talking about this, like refutation culture and talking about the excesses of it. So you see the civil war within Islam over how conservative and or liberal it should be. So that's what you have over here. And this is Daniel Hakekachu. And he's kind of with the Salafi refuters who are more conservative, who's trying to refute and respond to all of these things. And that's why I put the burning um, gay pride flag here because he's very, very vocal about his, um, you know, disgust with uh, gay rights. And um, yeah, that's one of his main, um, main points. So some of the issues here that he argues against them on are um, evolution, um, LGBT rights, um, interfaith activities, um, counter violent extremism. So sometimes these people will partner with the government in counter violent extremism, but he's very opposed to that. Um, and, uh, you know, to other issues as well. Then you have people like um, Fareed. Okay, and Fareed is, oh, bless, bless his heart. Okay, so Fareed <laughs> is wonderful. He, um, he's really basically taking on everyone else, every other critic of Islam Fareed has to handle. So the Christians who are coming at a polemical um, way, attacking some of the things in Hadith that people find problematic, the ex-Muslims who are attacking things, um, even the scholars who are raising questions, and then their work is being used by these um, critics of Islam, Farid is having to answer all of them. And Farid's main arguments and responses fall in three categories. Number one, Arabic. You don't know Arabic, so ha ha ha, you don't really understand what's going on. And he'll kind of like scoff at them. Um, number two, um, your own worldview is um, de deficient. You know, he'll criticize the atheist saying like, well, you don't have any moral legs to stand on. He'll criticize the Christian saying, you know, your Bible has something that's similar. So you don't have any legs to criticize. And then the third argument that he uses, and I think is his favorite argument is Hadith sciences. So Hadith, um, Farid has actually written a book about Hadith sciences and he's pretty knowledgeable in the field. So he can just come out and say like, well, that is not as weak and everyone knows that no one trusts this person and you're relying on a weak report and you don't know what you're talking about. But the problem with this approach is it's basically asking people to get more knowledgeable about Hadith science. It's like if all your responses rest on Hadith science, you're basically inviting people to then be like, okay, let's learn more about Hadith science. Okay, it's not only you that can learn about Hadith science. So once these critics of Islam become more fluent in Hadith science, there's gonna be a huge problem for people like Farid, I think. And then you have up here the non-Salafi Muslims, right? Like Mufti Abu Layth, who's a huge threat to Farid because he understands Hadith sciences very well. He speaks Arabic. He's actually memorized the Quran, right? And he's a very, very devout Muslim, but he has a completely different understanding of Bukhari and the Hadiths than Farid. And he's very critical of Farid's paradigm. And so then you have people like him who are also arguing, who are basically gift wrapping arguments for these critics to then use against Farid. And so as you can see, all of this leads to Islam deforming, right? Islam having to change Islam having to kind of reorient itself, especially Western Salafism. I want to be clear, there's tons of different types of Islam, but I'm kind of focused on this Western Salafism that we see on the internet most often. Um, I know that was a lot. I, I don't know if um, if there's any questions or- if, if Yeah, yeah, that was excellent. Um, we did have a, a very relevant question from Fleeting Blue. Uh, should we expect more sex to emerge as a result of the internet allowing groups of like-minded Muslims to find one another? That's a great question. I wanna be clear, there are a lot of sects of Islam. So Salafism is actually a very small percentage of the global Muslim world. And so that's another goal of our channel, um, of, of this channel is to um, shine a spotlight on all of them. We don't wanna just focus on the Salafis, right? Like don't give all, just the Wahhabis all the attention, right? We don't wanna focus on everybody, like the, um, um, you know, the Sufis, the Shias, the, the, the non-Salafi Muslims, and I think, um, you're going to see some of these communities rise. You know, here down in the corner, you have the biggest Shia YouTube channel. I think it's like six, ten thousand 10,000 or so, maybe less um, subscribers. But you're seeing these people also get onto social media. I think part of it is that Salafis, because they're more hardline, they're more um, vocal about their faith. They're more, you know, aggressive in trying to spread it. But you're also seeing people who are not Salafis who are getting on the internet, getting on social media platforms. And we're going to see... Um, you know, a lot of it is dealing with politics, right? Like a big reason why um, we see so much of this um, Salafism around the world is because of the Saudi money. So as the political trends change within the Middle East, um, you'll also see changes in what happens online. But yeah, definitely we'll see changes, I think. Uh, excellent. Um, we have a comment from NNWS. He said, Islam can only be reformed by the Arabs and not by a Muslim in the West or Pakistan. Islam is the religion of the Arabs. See Quran, uh, fourteen four. So 
I mean, th this is a good question. You know, how do we define Islam? Do we define it yeah. by what the source documents tell us Islam is? Do we define it by what the earliest Muslims believe? Or do we just kind of go with the, you know, the modern, postmodern uh, understanding that anyone can identify as anything? Right. And, <laughs> And, and you know it's still valid. Uh, yeah. This is debate in within Islam as well. Like, you know who exactly. is who is a real Muslim and, exactly. and who is not. That's so true. And that debate is what is consuming these people right now. You know that debate of who is a Muslim and who's not. Like, do these people are they also Muslims? Are these people also Muslims? Where are we drawing the line? Is is really um, a problem for this conservative strand of Islam because they are forced to then, um, yeah, like you know define, define these things and, and, and then make that clear. And once it's clear, people can um, raise questions about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, before you go on uh, one other comment from uh, Tiger R. My rule. Um, he says fluency in Hadith science will mean debunking the Hadith. The danger for Islam is the more they invite us to study, the more we do study and we find contradictions and inconsistencies. Um, I, I, I would agree with that statement that, you know, when you dig into the sources, they kind of refute themselves. And I, I think that's why Islam, you know, has this real problem that it's been it, two, two major problems. One, it's based almost entirely on authority. So then when, you know, people look at something, it could be, even be a trivial issue that doesn't have any real theological significance. But when they, they see what they've been told is, is not true, their confidence in Islam can break down really fast. And then the other reason is, you know, the the, the claims are, are so bold that they're, they're yeah. really easy to refute. Like, you know, the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down the letter. Well, if they said it was generally accurate that the message hadn't changed, that would be, you know, defendable. That would be hard to disprove. You'd actually have to, you know, form an argument, but to say right. no letters change, you just look at two manuscripts. There's a one letter difference. Well, that right. is clearly false. Right, right, yeah. I agree. Um, so yeah, so that kind of leads us naturally into Bukhari Gate. So what is Bukhari Gate? It's basically this problem that the Salafis like Farid are having right now, where you have um, their religion that is kind of uh, based on a very high view of um, Bukhari and the strong Hadith. Um, but then the problem is you have these very embarrassing and very awkward things that you find in the Hadith. Right, like um, Muhammad um, forcing himself on a woman, or Muhammad forgetting Quran verses, or Muhammad being bewitched by witchcraft. Right. So, what do you do with this? Do you accept this? If you accept Bukhari, you have to find a way to accept or justify this. But if you reject Bukhari, or if you have a lower view of Bukhari, you become a more progressive, from their perspective, more progressive Muslim, and you lose that Salafism, right? You lose the strictness and the um, the rigor of the religion that they find to be so important. So you have different approaches to this. So Farid is over here trying to justify or kind of say, um, explain away all the different problematic things or sometimes accept it and say, really the problem is with your Western modern presentism, um, liberal postmodern humanistic thinking, like, you know, discipline your mind, you Muslims. Um, and so you have that approach. And then you have Jonathan Brown, who's more willing to say, yeah, there are problems with Mukari, but he's afraid to open things up. He's literally said, we don't want to open the door on this because once you open the door, where are you going to close it, right? So he's very open. I appreciate his intellectual honesty. Um, and he says things like, you know, if we start to open up Hadith to be criticized based on their contents and based on how um, reasonable it seems to our Western modern minds, we are going to it's going to be a runaway train. You know, we're just going to start to throw out everything. And so he's very cautious of that. And then you have um, Mufti Abu Layth who follows a different school than Farid. And so he has a different entire paradigm. Um, and he says, well, actually, no, these things are blasphemous because they're making the prophet look bad. And, and he has his own paradigm for judging whether Hadith is accurate or not, a paradigm that Farid would um, vehemently disagree with. And so then Farid accuses Mufti Abu Layth of just having this fuzzy, touchy-feely, like, oh, whatever you feel like is uh, meets your Western sensibilities. But then Mufti's over here saying, no, actually, Farid is blaspheming the prophet by saying that he's a, a, a child, you know, slept with a child and, and um, was bewitched by magic. And so you have this kind of war going on. And that's what I call Bukhari Gate. Bukhari Gate is really this controversy over, um, over the Hadith and how to interpret it. And then also the fact that uh, when you look at this from a Western um, historical um, perspective, 
it, Bukhari is not very reliable, right? Like, like I think uh, Lloyd can talk much more about this uh, in much more detail, but there's so many problems. I think Mufti Abu Layt said it's like a house built on cobwebs, right? And I think that's a great description. And once that information comes out, how is Fareed going to defend it? So there's so many problems on so many levels for all three of these individuals. And um, I think getting some clarity on where they stand exactly, how they defend all the different problems that people see um, is going to be very, very interesting. Yeah, you know, it's definitely a, a difficult position because uh, on the one hand, you, you find these things that are really embarrassing in Sahih Bukhari, you know, the most authentic of all the Hadith collections historically been yeah. judged that way. Um, so on the one hand, you, you know, you kind of want to reject it if you're a Muslim. You, you right. want to say, well, you know, maybe Bukhari wasn't all that reliable, but then you realize that if you start throwing things out, well, I mean, where do you stop? Are you just creating your own religion based yep. on a pick and choose what you want kind of thing? Right. And right. is that really Islam anymore? And if you yeah. just go all the way and say, you know, none of the Hadith are reliable, then it's like, well, you just threw out 80, 90% of everything you believe as a Muslim because, you know, sure, throwing out that Aisha was, with six when, when she was married and nine when the marriage was consummated isn't particularly important theologically, but all the important theology is, is found in the Hadith. Exactly. And a lot of it is found only in the Hadith. It's not right. in the Quran at all. Yep. And, and I think that's, um, you know, when we have this conversation about what is real Islam, I think it's a popular conversation in these circles. Um, I really love what I think it was Bill Warner said, you know, you ask people, you know, they say, I have a Muslim friend that believes this. And so, you know, I have a Muslim friend who said this, or Zachary Knight said this, ask them, who's a better Muslim, your Muslim friend, friend or the Prophet Muhammad, you know, <laughs> and of course, they'll say, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, it's offensive, it's offensive question almost. Um, is Zachary Naik a better Muslim? Is, is Farid a better Muslim? Is Mufti Abu Layth a better Muslim or the Prophet Muhammad? And so then you just bring them to the sources about what actually Muhammad said and did. And then becomes a question, if you go a deeper level, whose version of the Prophet Muhammad, right? And so, that's where Hadith science and being able to talk about these things is really helpful and making these things simple and clear for people, which I hope to do, is helpful because then people can say, well, actually, this person's version of Muhammad says this, and that person's version of Muhammad says this, and back in these centuries, they used to say this, and back here, they used to say this. And so then it almost becomes an epistemological question of how do you even know anything about Muhammad and how do we know what he believed? So there's the plain literal reading, which leaves kind of a pretty problematic view of Muhammad from a Western perspective. But then there's also the question of, well, what version of Muhammad do you even want to take, which is also problematic. So it's this being stuck between a rock and a hard place that I see um, happening right now. Yeah, you know, and, and what, what you're aiming to do is, you know, just put people on the record. You're not even yeah. aiming to say you're you're the wrong position. You just want right. them to have a position. And right. I, I think that's really yeah. great because in a lot of ways, as many Muslims hide under their, their position not being clear. As long as exactly. you don't know what they, they say, you can't criticize it. Right, right, exactly. Um, okay, so here's just a quote from Fareed. He literally tweeted this today. You can see this morning. Okay, and so this is just gives you a beautiful example. The conservative Muslims understanding of who the prophet it was is based on his Sarah. The secular liberal Muslims understanding of who the prophet was is based on what makes them feel fuzzy inside, right? So he's directly, um, you know, shh, firing a shot at those people. And, and this is what you see happening all the time on social media right now. It's, it's they're, they're battling with each other about whose version of Islam is correct and um, whose version should stand. And it's, it's, it's wonderful because it brings so much Islamic clarity because internet is open, anybody can view these things, not just their target audience, but also um, non-Muslims. So that's helpful for Islamic clarity. Okay, so I just want to show some quick things from Bukhari. So when we talk about problematic things from a Western um, perspective, um, and again, I'm not trying to make that value judgment, but just generally from a Western perspective, um, many people would find these things problematic. So, um, you know, hashtag he forgot. So I like to use um, hashtags to try to give things a handle and a name. So it's not to be gimmicky, but it's just to help people to talk about it on the internet. So hashtag he forgot. Um, it says, the prophet heard a man reciting the Quran in the mosque and said, may Allah bestow his mercy on him as he has reminded me of such and such verses and su of such a surah. And this is Saheb Bukhari 661, 556. And that's sunnah.com. You can Google it right now. Um, and so that's narrated by Aisha. That's a strong hadith. Is that true? Do you accept that? If you accept that, how, what's your understanding of a prophet who forgets uh, verses of the Quran? 
Can you tell me about that a little bit more? If you don't accept that, can you tell me about your paradigm and your methodology of hadith criticism? What, how do you choose which hadith to accept or not? Okay, interesting. And whatever the answer is, again, it's not about picking a fight with someone. It's about seeking that Islamic clarity. And whatever the answer is, it gives you Islamic clarity. And also I think it'll give that person some Islamic clarity too. Um, this one uh, about uh, she was nine, hashtag she was nine. Uh, Khadija died three years before the prophet departed to Medina. He stayed there for two years or so. And then he married Aisha when she was a girl of six years of age. And he consumed that marriage when she was nine years old. So had Bukhari 5, 58 to 36. So Muhammad slept with Aisha when she was nine years old. Um, do you accept that? Is that true? Do you believe that? If you do, okay, interesting. If you don't, okay, why not? Um, what, once the prophet was bewitched so that he began to imagine that he had done things which he had not, in fact not done, Sahih Bukhari 453, 400, hashtag bewitched prophet. Okay, did Muhammad get bewitched by magic? Did he did? Interesting. Okay, so, so the prophet of Islam, the final prophet of Allah was bewitched by magic? Okay, interesting. Um, uh, what do you think about that? Are you okay with that? Okay, you don't believe that? On what basis are you rejecting it? Okay, so that's kind of the end of Bukhari Gate. I don't know if there are any more comments or anything before we move uh, on. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, we have a very interesting comment from NNWS. Um, he brings some great comments to my channel. He speaks Arabic and oh, is awesome. very familiar with the Arabic world. Uh, he says there was a hashtag two to three years ago called, uh, and then it's some Arabic letters. I can't read Arabic. So, uh, or, or the translation being the nonsense, crazy rantings of Al Bukhari. The postings were made by young Middle Eastern Muslims. Yeah, so even I mean, in even yeah. in the, the yeah. Middle East, you know, this kind of material is getting out there that that people who were once ignorant of the Hadith who could live their whole lives and only hear what the Imams wanted them to hear are now right. being exposed to the the crazy stuff. Right. And I from, think yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say from a modern perspective. Yeah, and I think actually it was, it's in 2018 where um, Mufti Abu Layth actually broke Bukhari Gate. He's the one who coined that phrase Bukhari Gate. And he was the one who's pushing, saying like, we need to stop because people are leaving Islam in troves because we've painted this image of Muhammad based on Bukhari. And, um, you know, Sheriff Gaber, I don't know, are you familiar with Sheriff Gaber? He's an ex-Muslim uh, no. Egyptian and he's a very famous. He's one of the most popular ex-Muslims and he does all his videos in Arabic and he puts English subtitles. And so he has this long video where he talks about just the claims of Bukhari, like how much that he actually had to have memorized if the Islamic tradition is true. And he just like kind of goes off mocking it. And it's very popular in the Arab speaking world. And I think actually in some ways the Arabic speaking world is ahead of the English speaking world in terms of criticism of Bukhari and um, uh, the the content of the Hadith. And so there's two ways also of criticizing Hadith. There's the content, and then there's also the historical reliability. And, you know, so you have people like the Orientalist, oh, the O word, um, or the Western <laughs> scholars of the last hundred years, like um, Joseph Goldziger and um, others who did this incredible scholarly work, you know, about the Hadith. And then it's largely been unfiltered to the masses. It largely hasn't permeated to the to the average Muslim or even to the average Western critic of Islam. And so you have people like David Wood who have been doing this for 20 years who have never touched really that field of, of um, Hadith criticism. So um, yeah, that's why I think Lloyd's work is gonna do a lot to bring Islamic clarity too. Uh, excellent. And we also had a question from Tiger. Have you noticed how most Western Muslims and I, I actually don't think this is restricted to Western Muslims. I think this would be most Muslims uh, instantly reject Ibn Ashaq or is Ibn Hassam uh, when one uses it to ask questions of Muhammad's character. Uh, if Ashaq goes, what of the Sirah remains? Exactly. Uh, so, so uh, the first question, you know, have have you noticed how they they throw Ibn Ashaq into the bus? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so there's actually this amazing uh, debate between Adnan Rashid and uh, Bernie Powers. So a Christian and a Muslim debating about Muhammad. And um, there's this incredible moment where Adnan Rashid is like, oh, all these things that he quoted are from Ibn Saq. And Ibn Hisak is not even reliable. And then Bernie Powers comes back on in the rebuttal and he plays a video of Adnan Rashid talking about Ibn Ishaq and how the things that we know about Muhammad's life are from Ibn Ishaq. And so, and so then Adnan Rashid has to come back up and they say, well, no, we can get some like, you know, some timeline things and, and make a reason for, for, for that uh, video. But I think 
the problem is so much of this stuff is obscure. It's a knowledge that only very, very, very few people have, the contradictions, the, the uh, complexity. And again, the goal here is not to make a new argument, it's not even to break new research. It's just to bring it to the masses. It's to make it clear for everyone. So, yeah, excellent. I think you kind of addressed the the secondary question. If you throw out Ibn Ishaq, uh, what remains of the Sira? And, and you know, I I mean, I think it's it's not a lot. Muslims do this a lot that they they kind of take the sources as true and then they get their picture of Muhammad from them, and then they use that picture to filter the sources. It's kind of just circular. That right. the, if you reject the source, then there's not really any information left. Right, right. And, and to, yeah, yeah. And again, how those different ways that people do the, you know, twisting and gymnastics to get those things to you know, work together um, is very, uh, is, is usually hidden. You know, that thinking and the hermeneutics and the um, theologizing is, is usually not made public. So. Uh, and then one more thing before we move on, uh, Live Evil 34 just said, read the book before orthodoxy. It's about the satanic verses and it will help you understand how these things developed. Awesome. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, myself as well. I, I just wrote it down for myself. So I'll check that out as well. Um, so next we have um, hashtag Quran Gate. Uh, Quran Gate, this is the big one. So um, on June 8th, as I think most of us know, Yasser Qadi made a huge admission where he said there are holes in the standard narrative, no one has the answers. This has troubled the Ummah from the very beginning, the question of Ahruf and Kirat, like how they relate to each other. So, um, you know, basically I made a chart to summarize the different stages that people are in. So there's the ignorance stage where people believe there's one Quran forever and always. This was, um, you know, popularized, um, you know, in this last few decades um, and, uh, and has uh, permeated um, the Muslim world. And many Muslims believe this. And then you have the confusion stage where people find out actually this isn't true. There isn't just one Arabic Quran and every Quran around the world is the same all over the world. And so they have this confusion and they try to ask these different leaders to explain it to them. And then you get to the repeating stage where you hear the standard narrative. Oh, there's oral transmission, so it's all okay. Oh, you know, there's different variant readings, the seven aharuf, that's why you have differences and it's all explained by the seven aharuf. Oh, we've known about this for 1400 years. Oh, don't worry about it, don't let this bother your faith. Oh, I can take a manuscript and read it and it's exactly the same as what we have today. And so then that's where a lot of Muslim Twitter is right now. That's where a lot of people are. Adnan Rashid has used this argument, Farid has used this argument. It's all keeping people in this understanding that okay, all these Christians and um, atheists, they think they found something new on Islam, but they really haven't. We've known about this all along. But the problem is this is not where it stops. What Yasser Qadi was talking about was not just the fact that there exists seven Ahruf. He was saying that there are holes in this narrative. There are holes in this narrative that no one has been able to answer. Um, questions about things like, um, how did Ibn Mujahid choose the seven canonical readings of the Quran? Why did Al-Tabari criticize his readings if, um, you know, all of them were seen as valid readings of the Quran? Um, and so many other uh, questions that are throughout the history of Islam. You know, Shadi Nasser has really done a lot of work in this field. He's written a book called The Transmission of the Variant Readings of the Quran, and he's actually coming out next week with another book of four years worth of research about this. And he argues that there are really five stages of canonization of the Quran. Um, the first stage being Uthman's recension, um, then Ibn Mujahid choosing seven, then um, Al, um, uh, then um, Al Jazari, you know, um, adding three more, and then um, you know them narrowing down the readers um, to two readers per uh, uh, per, per reading, and then finally in 1994 um, the the canonization of the Quran, the Cairo edition. I might have gotten one or two of the. Um, mixed up, but um, basically in his um, interview with uh, Colin on Islam critiqued, he really lays it out um, for you. And you can just see how the standard narrative does not hold any water, you know, like there are holes in the standard narrative. And basically you see Muslim apologists trying to keep people down here where they're not aware of these holes and they're working on a narrative. Yasser Qadi has said things like, I'm coming out with a paper soon that will shatter the delusions of um, I, I don't want to use the word delusions because I don't remember if you use that, but use the word shatter. I will use, I will come out with a paper that will shatter the arguments of the Islamophobes. And so they're frantically working on a narrative that can be historically robust, but then also um, theologically uh, uh, faithful, you know, to, to keep that idea that the, that the Quran is the perfect preserved word of Allah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have a video 
it, it was about uh, Kadi Gate, as I call it, but yeah. <laughs> Quran Gate also works, uh, where it's titled um, Ignorance and Censorship, the, the Two Foundations of Islamic Scholarship, or something pretty close to that. And uh, the idea is that uh, you know, you got to keep people ignorant because when they, they, they find out too many facts, then they, they start doubting Islam. And, you know, according to the Quran or, you know, Orthodox Islamic teaching, it, you don't have to actually reject Islam. You just have to doubt it a little bit and then you're already an apostate. Right, right. Yeah. And most people don't know that either. So that's another thing that could use um, some clarity. Um, so this is just a quote from Dr. Nasser, is the Quran preserved word for word? So this whole notion that the Quran is protected word for word is something that is used for the masses in a sense, and it is not based on any academic research and not necessarily Western academic, but academic research by classical Muslim scholars. So this was, I mean, just earlier this year um, in August, I believe is on a podcast where he talked about this. So this is, this information is getting out there. And, um, you know, obviously Dr. Nasser is a professor at Harvard and he's uh, very aware of the, um, of the evidence of the facts and the data. Um, and here I made a small chart just to show you why um, the June 8th interview was such a big deal. The reason it was such a big deal is because Yasser Qadi is a conservative still, um, despite his views about the Quran um, that he's kind of working out, um, um, working out making public. He still believes that Aisha was nine years old. He you know, says that we should not capitulate on that issue. And so theologically he's conservative, which is why people took what he said seriously. Um, Dr. Shabir Ali actually said something very similar to Yasser Qadi in 2017, but there was no stir, right? You notice no one really cared. Um, and so, because he was too far outside of the camp already on his other position, so no one really took him seriously. But you have people like Mansoor, Farid, Adnan, Rashid, and Hijab that are, um, are holding to this more conservative view. And then you have people like Yasser Qadi who are trying to bridge the academic and the conservative. And some of the buzzwords that you're hearing right now are multi-form text, textual variants. Um, at uh, Speaker's Corner the other day, uh, Hijab actually said this. He said there are textual variants and it's multi-form. And so just getting, nailing down these words, what do they mean? You know, Muslims love to use words, but defining them, not allowing the fallacy of equivocation where you're saying a word, but actually you're filling it with a different meaning. And that's exactly what people like Farid are accusing Yasser Qadi of doing. They're saying that he's equivocating. He's using the word preserved, but actually he means something different. And Farid sees Yasser Qadi as dangerous to the Ummah because he says he's kind of using, you know, bringing in a Trojan horse of liberal theology into um, the Muslim community. And then you have people like Mufti Abu Lays who believe in something called dynamic preservation. Um, and um, then you have, of course, Shadi Nasser, who is um, more focused on the facts and not really too constrained by um, a particular theological understanding of the Quran and is you know, criticized by many different fronts. So, yeah. Uh, excellent. We have a question from Bazal Getty Blaster. Uh, he said, Hi, Thaddeus, struggling to keep up with the fast moving narrative in the recent weeks. Can either of you explain what the difference between the terms Kiryat and Aruf are? So um, Aruf are the seven, so there's a hadith that talks about this. It says that the um, Quran was um, revealed in seven modes and there's been really no agreement on what Aruf means. So many people define that in many different ways. And then the Qur'an are the particular readings. They're the particular readings of the Qur'an. And so um, the relationship between the Haruf and Qur'an is where a lot of the controversy lies, right? Like this is where people are debating and how they're trying to um, understand them. Like some people say, well, after Uthman burned it, you know, we lost all the Haruf except one. And then all the different Qur'an that we have today are based on that one Haruf, whereas others say, no, that's not like that. And so this is where we need to get clarity from people because the whole controversy lies in how to justify the different versions of the Quran we see today. And, um, you know, in light of, of, um, of what we, of what we can know about this. Yeah. In the, the full interview, if you watched the, the full interview rather than just, you know, the little clips that everyone played at, at one point, Kadi talks about how there's 30 different scholarly opinions and none of yeah. them explain all the data. Right. And what he's talking about is there's, you know, 30 plus different Muslim interpretations of yes. what the word Aruf means. Yeah. So uh, to answer your question, no one knows what Aruf means, but right. Kiryat is reading. Right. Um, okay, so next steps. So thank you so much if you followed along this presentation this whole time. I know it's very, very exciting information, but, um, I, but, but yeah, it is exciting because it kind of is like we're at the cutting edge of, um, of, of getting clarity on these things. So next steps, ask questions. You know, when you're on social media, 
Um, it's not about winning an argument. I think just asking questions of people and sometimes those questions can help you and that person also reflect on what they believe. Um, um, use hashtags. I know that hashtags can feel like almost childish or like for teenagers, but I, it really helps to be able to talk about things. I actually searched the hashtag Karangate the other day on Twitter and so many posts came up about this. And if we didn't have that hashtag, how would you search about this? Would you type in like Quran preservation? You would get so many different mixes of things, like even hold the narrative I typed. And there were some good tweets there, but it was much more consolidated if you and streamlined if you use those hashtags. So again, it's not about Islamic clarity, this channel and, and this brand or something. It's about helping the conversation um, spread across the internet so that people who have no idea about this channel can also talk about this and learn about this and understand it. And then finally search. So like there's, the internet is a huge place. You know, there's so many of us. Um, and so if all of us are looking for Islamic clarity, looking up videos, sending them to me, sending them to Thaddeus, um, put, making your own YouTube channel, making your own Twitter, posting things, it's so simple. Just get a YouTube downloader, uh, get a video editor, uh, clip things, you know, and post them on the internet and then ask questions. It's not about, you don't have to be scared because it's not about getting in an argument with someone. You can never lose an argument if you're looking for Islamic clarity, right? Um, you're just asking questions to people and then, conversing with them. And if they, if they answer and they have a good answer for you and they are very confident in it, you can say, thank you for your Islamic clarity. I appreciate that. And then go back and look at what they've said, dig into it more and understand things better. So um, this is going to be a team effort. It really is. It's, it's not about this channel. It's not about um, um, yeah, any one person. It's about being able to get that clarity for the whole world. You know, there's 1.6, 1.8 billion Muslims. That means that literally the whole world lives with Muslims, right? Like Muslims are everywhere, non-Muslims are everywhere. Uh, I think Muslims and non-Muslims deserve Islamic clarity on, um, on the world's second largest religion. Um, and then lastly, welcome to the Clarity Crew, right? Like I was just saying, like hashtag Clarity Crew, um, clarity is reasonable, be clear, um, clarifying queries. So you can call your questions, hashtag clarifying queries, clarity seekers and Islamic confusion. Using these hashtags will help people to be able to join this community and um, really, uh, I think, streamline and speed up the rate at which we're able to get this clarity. Um, I think that's all I have for us, Thaddeus. Excellent. Uh, so I'll open it up for general questions here. I'll, I have one in a second, but I just wanted to say, you know, thank you very much for this presentation. I think what you're trying to do is really great. Uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of creators aren't very active in the comments, but I, I'm extremely active in the comments. I, I always try to engage the, the Muslims that come. And that's one thing I see over and over again is this lack of clarity, this, this yeah. Islamic confusion, as you put it, where, uh, you know, the, the person will say, uh, you know, you'll, you'll ask them what the, the, one of my favorite questions to ask people is what is your best argument, uh, best evidence that Islam is true. Mm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ignore it. That That's fine. They can, they can ignore it if they want. That tells me something already that they, they don't right. want to engage in the subject. Uh, or, uh, you know, what I'll get is either some, some complaint about Christianity, which tells me nothing about Islam, or I'll get, uh, well, you know, go watch the, this video, uh, Back uh, several years ago, it'd always be Zach or Nike. Now there's some more variety about who yeah. it will be, but it'll be you know go watch the this video, and um, I always reply to that is like, uh, wh why why should I watch this video? What what is in it that um, <laughs> makes you makes you think it's a good argument? And yeah. and no one ever has a reply uh, to that. Right. Uh, or or you know the more sophisticated ones who don't just like send me some video will you know be like you don't know anything and then they'll just throw out a bunch of a word salad which doesn't actually say anything if you know what what they're t yeah, talking about but if you don't yeah. know anything about the subject it, it looks like this person has uh, you know a lot of knowledge they yeah. you, and, and you back down and you're like well right. uh you know this person's over my my head i i can't get any understanding here uh yeah. they must have good reasons and i think that's what they intending to do. They're intending not to answer the question, exactly. but just to give this impression of confidence. Right. And I think there's two things that I especially see on Twitter and probably other social media too, that really contributes to that. It's this feeling that if the person who gets the last word is the winner, you know, so if you keep going back and forth and the person like says something and you don't respond, it just like, oh, you lost, you couldn't respond. Right. And so a lot of people aren't actually judging the content. They're just kind of judging the theatrics or the, the optics of a debate or a conversation even. And um, another thing is this idea of, um, 
Uh, I think I just lost it. But yeah, so so again, just it's not really about that. Oh, if you block someone, if you block someone, then you lost. You know, it's like, well, actually, maybe that person's just like kind of uh, being disrespectful, or maybe it's like, uh, uh, you know, it's like it's not really leading to productive conversation. So I'm not really trying to engage. But it's like, oh, look, he blocked me. He won't respond to me. He obviously can't. And um, again, that's obviously people's freedom to choose. But as those things become more clear and they're put on the record, I think people will be able to make up their own minds on whether they find that persuasive or not. Yeah, when I'm having a, a conversation with a Muslim, my number one goal is always just to get them thinking, uh, you know, actually stopping a robot and just copying and pasting stuff and not thinking about it, but actually, you know, take a step back and think about whether what they're saying makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So one great way to do that is to ask questions. And of course, you don't really have to have a lot of knowledge about anything to right. ask questions. <laughs> no, you don't. So, you know, I, I think anyone can uh, jump in on this. And yes. then the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, the hashtags are great. Uh, I, I, I do not have a, a talent for making the, these catchy hashtags myself, but you're right. They, they help you, you, um, you know, organize information and get everyone who's talking about the same subject on the same page. Yes. Uh, if everyone's using, you know, the, the same hashtag, then you, you can find each other and, and, right. you know, contribute to the same conversation. If you're just, using your words, it's, it's really hard to find other people yeah. that you don't already know about that right. are saying the same things. I mean, I mean, just look at the Black Lives Matter movement, right? The whole movement was kind of birthed out of, it was, it was kind of brought together through this hashtag, this one hashtag. And so now you see it's a global movement. And um, I think a lot of the success has been in being able to identify under this um, one banner. Um, you know, another one, like hashtag make America great again, right? MAGA. So that like, just by saying that you can immediately identify a whole plethora of ideas and people and um, um, ideologies with one hashtag. And so that's what it does. It gives you a handle on things. Absolutely. Uh, so we have a question from Fleeting Blue. I'm a little worried that Twitter Islam is not mature enough to have some of these more difficult discussions. Do you know of a better place to have these conversations? Yeah, I mean, um, I think the thing is on Twitter, um, even if the people that you're having the conversation with is not being very mature, there's a lot of other people who are reading it. So it's not always, the conversation isn't always for the sake of the person that you're having it with. Sometimes it's for people who will come by later. Um, I think YouTube is a great place, Facebook, Instagram. I mean, the fact of the matter is bad arguments will be self-evident. I think, um, and when people say things or res are resorting to insults, I try not to respond, um, obviously not with insults, but even just respond. And I just let it just sit there. And I sometimes even retweet it when people um, do insults because I find it, it's like, okay, well, you know, I like I, people can judge for themselves um, what, they, what they think about this. So yeah, um, to answer the question, I think, you know, the only way to, to increase the level of conversation is if we, increase the level of conversation, right? And, and then don't engage when things are getting into mucky, mudslinging um, and to, to model, um, you know, a, a different approach. Uh, excellent. So we're, we're just gonna open it up for general questions now. If you have questions about the presentation or just anything you'd like to hear uh, Islamic Clarity's uh, opinion about, go ahead and put those in the chat. We had this question earlier, but I saved it for the end since it wasn't directly on topic. Uh, NNWS asks, uh, why, is why is Allah silent about the Hindus and the Buddhists? Could it be because he's an Arabian deity that had no clue about any place except Arabia? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not an expert in that, but I would be, I, that would be a great question. I would love to ask. Um, you know, some Muslim leaders and see what they think about it. Yeah. Right. And I mean, you don't have to have an answer. Just asking right, this right. kind of question yeah. may, makes people really think it's like, uh, you know, the, the Quran claims that there were thousands of prophets or I think specifically one for every different language on, right. on earth. And then the Hadith make it explicit that there was a hundred thousand different prophets. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, like you so you got this claim that there's a hundred thousand prophets one for every language group right. and then you got the quran that seems to only know about jewish prophets and no other prophet right you know, maybe a dozen or so jewish prophets and just ask that question why does it why does the 
Quran, if the, if the same message was given to every people in their own language, how come we only know about it from uh, the, the Jewish scriptures, the, the Christian scriptures, and the Islamic scriptures? What happened to the other 99.999% right. of the, the prophets? And how come the Quran doesn't know about any of these previous prophets? It only knows about how Allah kept sending more and more prophets to the, the Jewish people, but none to anyone else, that, as far as it knows. Right. Uh, so here's an odd question. Uh, so is the vagina-shaped stone in Mecca the same as the talking womb of Allah that pulls down Allah's trousers? <laughs> and, um, you know, I have no idea how to answer that one myself. Yeah. I'm going to pass on that one. I mean, I, I think that's, um, I think that question brings up some interesting um, points, though. Like, I think in our conversations with Muslims, like, I think we should try not to um, be gratuitous. I mean, like, we should, like, not uh, intentionally try to offend, you know, because I think a lot of times, like, even in my videos, I don't use music in my videos, because I, um, I want Muslims to watch my videos. And I actually had a Muslim uh, um, tell me, like, you know, some Muslims are just going to turn off your videos right away, because you put music in them. And I said, Oh, my goodness, I didn't realize that, you know, so I stopped doing music. And um, even when I represent Muhammad, I don't use a cartoon that's not to say I disagree with people who choose to do that. I understand their, their reasons for that. But um, for me, like I want to be able, my content to reach people who are offended by pictures of Muhammad, you know? And so even, I mean, I, I understand the person in the question is, is trying to, um, you know, make a point, but um, you know, just even that language is, I think that can kind of cut off people's ears sometimes to even hear the question. Cause it's, it, it's a good, question in terms of you know is there a relationship or or it can, it can be a good question i should say it that way but um yeah i think that there's a there's a lot of debate about these types of things of like how how provocative to be and i'm definitely i definitely understand the reasoning for people and i can um you know uh be supportive of of people's goals and trying to normalize dissent and normalize um uh, being able to say things that are offensive but i just find for for what i'm trying to do it's not helpful to alienate or push away people um, unnecessarily. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with what you're saying that, you know, there's a difference between offending someone be, because of, of the, you know, the difficulty of the subject matter right. and intentionally uh, offending them. Like, yes. you know, you, you can ask, uh, you know, if, if Muhammad's the perfect example for all humanity, mm -hmm. then why did he marry a young girl and sleep with her when she turned nine? Right. You know, the, that, that's a respectful way to ask a question that's probably yeah. offensive by its nature. Right. But you could, right. you could go the other way and say, you know, why was your prophet a disgusting pedophile? Exactly. And, exactly. and you're, you know, you might not get an answer either way, but yeah. uh, the first one, at least you have a chance. Right, right. And again, I'm not saying that there's categorically no time when someone can ask it the other way, but for me and just my approach on this channel, I would much, I would ask it the first way because I just find that um, it's more, uh, yeah, more likely to get a response. Uh, let's see, uh, a whole series of, uh, of posts came in. Some of them are just comments. Um, so I'm trying to find the questions. Uh, okay, so Tiger asks, Serious point for me. If Isa could not judge the character of those who trusted with the real Injil, how can Allah trust him to judge at the end times? Great question. I would love some Islamic clarity on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, so, so again, like ask, like I think sometimes there's these whole cubs of people who live um, uh, like, you know, who are, you know, follow David Wood or follow a lot of these other people, but, but like, and I, and, you know, they're on Twitter and they're talking with people, but, but, you know, build a platform, like ask people, you know, this doesn't take expertise. You don't have to be an expert in Islam to ask that question. You know, like there's very simple questions that you can ask and it's not to fight people. It's not to, you know, it's not to um, make people angry. It's just to really understand because that is a very good question. If, if Asa is going to come down at the end times and judge the souls of people, right. Or, or whatever the Islamic tradition says exactly. Like how, how could he not be trusted to preserve the Injil? Like that's, yeah. I would love to hear the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I, I definitely recommend, you know, you know um, reading reading the Quran at, at least and thinking about what it's saying so that you can ask your own questions. You know, the, the questions that are most obvious that, uh, 
you know, that you'll glean it on the very first time you watch an anti-Islamic video. Right. Muslims might not have good answers for them, but they definitely have prepared answers for them. Right. So you're not going to force them off their script by, you know, asking about Aisha, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if it's just a someone you know in real life, they, they very well might not know that. And that might right. be more than sufficient. But if you're, you know, you're talking to someone online who engages in this kind of material, they're going to have some sort of answer for that. And it's going to be satisfactory in their own mind, even if um, no one else would accept it. Right. Oh, so we have a question from Fleeting Blue asking if you have a Patreon account. Uh, no, I do not have a Patreon account. If you have money to donate, there's a lot of better things uh, that you can, <laughs> and people who are much, much more in need of money. So um, I'm sure you can find people who, who need money for help. Excellent. I, I will mention that I do have a Patreon account. Um, not that I, I need money, and I definitely would. I would definitely encourage people to, you know, donate to the their local church or something be, yeah. before that, but. Uh, you know, when people throw in one dollar a month, it, it makes me realize how much they value the the material. Um, so, you know, I'd rather have someone. I almost rather have someone just donate one dollar than you know donate a substantial amount. It's, it's more the more the thought that the encouragement that you know uh, the material is valuable. Uh, so uh, Rebecca says hashtag Clarity Crew in the house. So Ooh, you have, oh yeah, <laughs> you have a, a member of the Clarity Crew here. Yes. Uh, so uh, Thunder Swan just arrived, and he said, "Have you been chatting about the Sahi nonsense?" So uh, this would be a good time to kind of summarize your main talking points in you know a sure. minute or two. Yeah. So basically. There's a closet in Islam, and there's a lot of skeletons in the closet, and um, a lot of the Muslim leaders are aware of those skeletons, and they're trying to keep things in the closet. But because of the internet, and because of English, and because of critics of Islam, a lot of these skeletons are coming out. Things like the fact that the Quran is not preserved perfectly dot by dot, the fact that Bukhari has a lot of um, hadith and things about um, Muhammad that are pretty unsavory from a Western perspective, the fact that Bukhari is uh, pretty unreliable from a Western um, perspective um, historically. And so um, a lot of these things are, you know, Muslim leaders are trying to keep them in the closet, but they're coming out because of the internet. So our job at Islamic Clarity is to examine them, is to examine them closely and clearly and to make them clear for Muslim masses, for non-Muslim masses, so they can see exactly um, what, um, you know, Islam is teaching and, and to make those things very, very clear for people. Excellent. Uh, here's a, a question that fits right in with your mission. Uh, Live Evil asks, how common is the belief of jinn and uh, beliefs associated with it in Islam? Um, I don't have like a poll number off the top of my head, but I would imagine it's pretty common. I mean, angels is one of the six pillars of faith. Um, you know, believing in angels is one of the six pillars of faith. So I, I would imagine that going along with that would be jinn and the demonic. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that would be definitely be an area where, uh, you know, asking these questions is really helpful because yeah. it, it's one of those things that the, they're comfortable talking about it in the mosque, but right. not so comfortable talking about it in public. You know, it's it, it could be a holes in the narrative type moment where, you right. know, the, these beliefs about jinn are come out and they're they're clarified and then people are like, Wait, wait a minute. I had no idea that Islam believed this. Right, right. Exactly. Uh, question from uh, JX. Do you think the followers of Muhammad unknowingly worship a pagan stone because they blindly follow Muhammad? Uh, I would imagine most Muslims wouldn't describe themselves as worshiping a pagan stone. And then if they did say believe that they're worshiping a pagan stone they would not be doing it so <laughs> i guess i guess there's an assumption couched in that question that that they are worshiping a pagan stone and i would say um i don't think that most muslims would accept that assumption so yeah, yeah good answer there uh <laughs> uh rafa buddy said how can the ngl be preserved when christians themselves have also admitted the bible is corrupted please explain this um I'll go ahead and tackle that one. So, I, you know, this idea that I, I 
my opinion would be that it's just an excuse that, you know, they, they see what the Quran is clearly teaching, that the previous scriptures are inspired and that all it promises to protect them. So they take this word in Jeel, which is just the Arabic word for, or a translation, transliteration into Arabic of the Greek word for gospel and uh, say, well, that's something different than what the Christians are looking at. So it's purely a matter of faith that there, there's this different book that's somehow different than the gospel. I don't think they put any more thought into it than that. Right. And I also think, I mean, when you look at the earliest Muslims, um, you know, my understanding is that they had a different understanding of corruption than, than what was kind of said later on. And that's something I hope to dive into um, soon as well to get more clarity on that. Uh, definitely. Uh, so Bazal Getty asks, what prompted uh, you to launch your channel at this particular time? Yeah, I mean, I actually, so I can share a story here that I haven't shared um, publicly yet. Um, so like I said earlier in the stream, you know, I, it was by getting to know um, some Muslim friends that um, kind of got me interested in or helped me to realize how much Islamic confusion is out there. But um, I launched a channel, uh, like I made the public cha the channel public, I think in May of this year, but then I started posting more content actually after the Yasser Qadi interview. And um, I was actually the one who um, um, found that interview. <laughs> so, so I was um, watching that, that podcast with Yasser Qadi and Muhammad Hijab just as a podcast. And then I heard Muhammad Hijab ask the question that he asked about the Quran. And I paused the video and I just was like, did he really just ask that? Like, like I, I was shocked. And so I kept playing it. And throughout the 28 minutes, I just kept pausing it. Like, oh my goodness, like, is he really saying this right now? And so I sent it to Islam Critique. I actually um, posted it under one of his videos and, um, you know, under his original video where he clips it, he, he says, you know, shout out to Islamic Clarity for, for sharing this video with me. Um, so that's kind of like my, uh, what's the word, um, uh, you know, a breakout. Yeah breakout moment that you could say. Um, but yeah, so I think just seeing how, like, especially with that video where I was like, wow, like this is really, this is really big. And then um, from there, I've kind of tried to be more, uh, you know, public in, in publishing things. Excellent. Uh, some back and forth chatter, scrolling to see if there's any other questions. Oh, here we go. Uh, from Thunderous One, how many Hadith existed prior to the ones chosen and what was the criteria used to choose them? Yeah, so I don't know the exact number of Hadith, um, but the criteria are related to the Isnad, so the chain of transmission, how reliable those people are. So they, Muslims would say they know the character of each of those people, their memory, their lifestyle, how often they prayed. They often boast that they can basically write a biography of every single person in the chain. And so um, one way that you evaluate Hadith is looking at the chain of transmission, if the people are reliable. Another um, way is um, looking at the content of the Hadith, um, whether it's uh, reasonable or true. And of course, different schools of thought have different criteria and different exact sciences of hadith. Um, but yeah, the content and the chain are two of the, the main ways that uh, people judge a hadith. Yeah, you know, if we take Bukhari seriously, there were 600,000 hadith that he filtered through. But if you actually do the math, that seems to be completely impossible. So I would say that no one actually knows how many hadith existed. I would say it was probably, you know, he ended up picking 6,000. I would say he maybe looked at 10,000 or something. I don't think it was anywhere near the number he claims. Uh, let's see. Uh, Uh, there's a question about the difference between Yahweh and Allah. We'll skip that since it's not really relevant to what we're discussing. Um, but I would like to do a, a video on that at some point since you know, Muslims always claim they worship the same God. And then as soon as you point out things that are in the Old Testament, they're like, uh, we don't believe those things. It's yeah, like, well, well, then I, mean, I think Apostate Prophet has a really interesting video about that where he talks about a lot of the names that have um, like Elijah, right? That, that um, has the, the uh, name Yahweh, you know, embedded in the meaning, but then it's kind of used even among Muslims, whereas they would claim that you know, that is not necessarily the name of their deity. So very, very interesting. <laughs> uh, so Liv Evil said that Abu Leif says there are about 10,000 hadith. So that would be consistent with my random guess. Uh, okay. So that, that, that's interesting. Um, 
Let's see here. What is the most absurd hadith in your opinion? Okay, so I think there's one hadith that I find so interesting. It's um, about fly dunking. So it says like, if a fly falls into your drink, you need to like catch it and then like dunk its other wing into it because one wing carries disease and one wing carries the cure. I'm probably like misquoting it a little bit, but I just, I just found that when I read that hadith, I was like, wow, that is really specific. So I asked some Muslims, you know, on Twitter about that. I was like, you know, is this true? Like, is this a strong hadith? And they said, yeah, it is. And they sent me scientific articles, you know, about this. And I was just like, who knew that uh, I, I was supposed to be dunking the flies? Like, I don't have that many flies fall into my drinks. But um, if I do, this is really good to know. So um, yeah, that hadith I find to be really, really interesting. And I think um, I, I, just, I just was very surprised by it. Uh, excellent. Uh, there was a comment from Virginia that we should probably wrap up to keep it uh, relatively short and easy to listen to. And uh, before we actually started, uh, we have the same conversation that we would try to keep it to around an hour and a half, which is where we are now. So I will just uh, take one more question from the audience and then I have uh, a closing question for you. The question comes from Kaiser. Uh, would you be interested in debating a Muslim? Um, so I'm not terribly interested in debating. Um, I think it's better to just ask and people can give answers. Um, I really appreciate the fact that on social media, you can you know, have access to um, you know, a lot of Muslim leaders and organizations and um, countries that you can find this information, ask people directly. And then if they want to provide that clarity, they can. If they don't, that's fine. There's a lot of people to ask. So yeah, not, not on my list of things to do right now, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> Excellent. There's a, a, a few additional good comments, but um, if, if you can just put those in the, the comment section after the video is done, uh, we'll take a look at those later and address them. Like I said, I'm very active in the comments. So anything you put there, uh, I, I will address at the very least. And I think Islamic Clarity will definitely um, take a look at the comments and see if there's anything yes. that he wants to address as well. Uh, my closing question for you would be, what would you say to any Muslims out there who are currently confused about Islam? Uh, what should they do? That's a great question. Um, I think, hmm, I think keep seeking the truth, keep asking, right? Like, like you were saying at the beginning, Thaddeus, like, um, the truth is not afraid of questions. If the truth is really the truth, then um, then it shouldn't be uh, uh, it shouldn't need to be protected or 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 maybe protected is the wrong word, but it shouldn't be afraid of the light. We shouldn't be afraid of 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 challenge. And I think um, find people that maybe disagree with you on some things, maybe even um, non-Muslim friends um, that you can um, share with, or even a Muslim friend, like that you can share your questions with. Like having another person, I think, that you can share with and, and process things with would be um, really helpful. And then um, just don't stop. Don't stop searching. Um, don't be afraid of questions. I think, um, I want to just say this very clearly, Thaddeus, like I love Muslims so much. And I um, really, really, um, I, I think, yeah, like when you're having moments where you're questioning things that are very important to you, that can be really painful and scary even. And so I would just encourage Muslims like, yeah, to, to, to you know, take things at your own pace, um, but also don't be afraid of, of questions and of, about of what you'll find. Excellent. Uh, very well put. You know, uh, if Islam's the truth, then you have nothing to be afraid of. And if Islam is not true, then you should be uh, interested in learning that as well, regardless of how painful it is. The truth is more important than, you know, uh, having an easy idea in your mind, I would say. So thank you very much for joining me today, Islamic Clarity. Um, for anyone who watching who wasn't here at the start, a link to his channel is in the video description box. And I will put a link in the pinned comment as well. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, stay tuned. Later this week, I'll be having a live stream with uh, Lloyd and Io. We're going to be answering the question whether Paul corrupted the gospel or whether he taught the same message as the other apostles. I'm going to kind of um, take a look at the letters of Paul and compare them to the gospels as well as the Old Testament to see if the theology is the same. 
I'll also have a scripted video out sometime this week. Uh, you may or may not have heard that there was a survey that came out in July that showed that uh, at least 50% of the nation of Iran no longer identifies as Muslim personally. Uh, and I'm gonna delve more into the details. You may have heard the top line, but there's a lot of interesting information in the details as well that I did not see in any news stories. So uh, be on the lookout for that. It has been recorded and editing is almost complete. So that should be out on Monday or Tuesday or so. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, whether your day is just beginning or whether it is coming to an end, depending on what part of the world you are. Thank you and God bless. Bye guys. Thank you, Thaddeus.